Welcome to Kid Cage. Absolute honour and pleasure to have you here this evening. Um, first of all, I'd just like to understand your reasoning of why you joined the armed forces. Uh, simple, really. I loved the military as a kid, so I love war movies. Uh, I remember vividly as a young kid, like carving out like knives <laughs> out of wood. Uh, Specifically, first blood, Rambo knife. Yeah, I had to have that. Um, I always had toy guns. I had like an arsenal of guns at home, uh, like a full armory. And I loved it, mate. I love putting cam cream on. I love crawling around in the dirt. And I remember feeling like that all the way up till I was about 15. You know, when you start like then 15, 14, 15, you're sort of branching away from the kiddie shit and you're hanging out with your pals. Uh, you're hanging out with street corners, you're meeting girls and all that sort of stuff. Uh, it sort of it sort of leaves your mind a little bit. And then when I was leaving school, we had to do our options. And for some reason, I wrote Royal Marines Commando. I don't know where I got that from. I don't even know how that entered my head, but that's what I put down. Uh, again, I, I never went into the Royal Marines, obviously. Uh, I got a job, uh, left school straight away. I was working as an apprentice for an uncle. Uh, as a plaster, an apprentice plasterer, and I was gra I was putting some grafting, and I was looking at these guys <laughs> they're making money, and I wasn't making much money. And I was working in Liverpool at the time, and it just it just come into my head, and I went down to the Liverpool careers office, and that was it. I was done. I was in at 16, 16 and nine months. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that's a very young age to be joining the military. Yeah. Um, if we could uh, fast forward to 2010, um, you're heading off to Afghanistan. It's the first time you're going downrange. What was going through your mind as you were entering the sandbox for the first time? Well, Charles, it was 2007 first. It was Iraq. Right. Um, went to 2000. Went to Afghan in 2009. Um, so if I just, I'll answer that question as it as if you asked it for Iraq. Yep. For, for me, we couldn't wait to go. And like, we've been my my battalion, uh, two RGJ, second battalion, Green Jackets. We were just we were amalgamating with a bunch of other regiments to take, to form the the Rifles Battalion. And we hadn't just unlucky for us, we hadn't deployed to Iraq since it had kicked off or Afghan. We'd always been in a either a training role, uh, two years in Northern Ireland, and we just kept on missing it. Uh, in hindsight, I'm glad we did, because when we went, it was extremely kinetic. Um, the feeling for me going there was just, I just couldn't wait to go. I literally, I'm like, I was, I was, I was like a dog with a bone. I, I really wanted to get over there and get and get to work. Uh, just watching all the other units, watching YouTube, watching the news, and feeling like we'd missed out massively, was huge on us. So by the time it was our turn to go, we were fully fired up and ready to smash if we needed to. Wow. I couldn't wait. Um, what was your first experience of a kinetic engagement in Iraq? Uh, I was about 11 days in. Wow. Um, we'd, we'd been out on a, on a patrol, and it was a, it was a protection roll. Line, line the road, we'll bring a convoy in. Get some food in, resupply, etc. We'd, we'd gone out in an evening, and we took an engagement, and it was an RPG, and a few rounds overhead, and like none of us return fire. It was from one of the villages. It was way too far out to return fire effectively, but one of the guys like put a shamuli up, 
and a, and a loom. And like that was it. We're like, oh, we put a loom up. It was like the biggest thing. Like, fuck yeah, we've got some fucking, we put a flare up. That was as exciting as it got. Um, we came in, and as we're driving in, the, the wagons, obviously, they'd overheated. We'd been out that long. The heat, etc. Uh, a lot of the wagons were, were going down. And we were in the new Bulldog uh, 432 variant, which I would say is very good for cutting troops around in an urban environment. Um, we got back into the palace, and my vehicle had piled in literally at the gate. Um, my teammate, his wheels were on fire, rolling in uh, in the morning time, about 6 a.m. We get in, vehicle park, and we got a set of QBOs, right? We need to take um, general, or go into town, back into town, to the PJCC and pick up some general and a bunch of guys who are now leaving the theatre. Um, priority tasking, it's got to get done. And to be fair, we were all exhausted. We'd been out on a full night off. Um, it was not eventful, but we were all fatigued and tired. Yeah. My vehicle's knackered, so it's not going. But I am not staying in. So I'm like, right, find a vehicle. So I got my driver. I was like, get another vehicle now. So he's racing around trying to get uh, another vehicle. I'm racing around to the comms guys because it was my comms that were knackered, trying to fix my comms. And speaking to me, one of my best mates, he was the platoon sergeant, Scott Martin. I'm like, Scott, man, I'm in shit state. I need to get my wagon sorted. Well, the only spare wagon went to another another uh, teammate of mine. So he got the spare vehicle. I'm left without any vehicle. So I was like, okay. Um, platoon sergeant's wagon, dismount, get out. I'm going. Um, I took my mate uh, with me, bags. He jumped in with me because we had to strip down because we were picking passengers up. We could only have two dismounts per vehicle. Yeah. So jumped in with them guys because I didn't want to get left behind. Uh, we got a couple of the Lance Corporals, dealt with the rest of the platoon, get back to admin, and we'll be back in a few hours. So we took a we took a quick trip up to the PJCC, right into the heart of the city. And then we sort of hung around in this PJ small little police station for what seemed to be about four or five hours. Um it was sort of late afternoon when we left. And I was already struggling with that. I was like, man, we've been here so long. If anyone, everyone's seen us coming in, they know we've got to go out and there's only so many routes, mate. We, we, we'll get ambushed here easily. But it is what it is. We've got to go. Yeah. Well, by the time we leave, we're all mounted up and we head out. Within, I think, within 10 minutes, we were ambushed. And it was a massive ambush. I'm in the dismount, I'm in the back of a vehicle. We've got the hatches down, so my head's up. And I'm watching this, uh, like a low loader and a fuel vehicle, like a big, big 18 wheeler that was on fire, that had been smashed up. That was part of our, our convoy. And what had happened, they'd ambushed it. They took that, took that vehicle out and they'd ambushed one of our front vehicles. Uh, unfortunately, in that ambush, my teammate, Jez, he, he was killed. He was a vehicle commander. He was shot straight away. And his driver, Brett, who's a really good mate of mine, um, he's he's still in now. He's running his own company. Uh, he's running one of the rifle companies now as a sergeant major. He casually backed him down from the hatch, dealt with him, and then drove on his own with no direction. And bear in mind, he'd been up that road once or into the city once, and he navigated a convoy, a company back on his own. Wow. Uh, that guy is legit. I don't know. As a, I think he was 19 at the time, a 19-year-old rifleman leaving a co leading a company with no commander, and he didn't know the route. He just navved it back because he sort of knew his, he had the bearings right. Wow. So this is all happening, but my vehicle that I'm involved in and another vehicle it was the medical med the med wagon. We were tasked to do something different. Now I didn't know what, what that was, but we 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 leave the convoy. Um. At a bridge called Red 10, that was the spot, Red 10, uh, we had a vehicle that was ambushed and it had a Saxon on the back of it. So obviously they don't want that Saxon getting into the insurgent's hands. So it was, you guys go there and protect that vehicle until we can come and get you. Well, no one come and got us. <laughs> so we've got two bulldogs. One's a med, med, med vehicle with just a medic in the back and a vehicle commander. Our vehicle, with a vehicle commander, GPMG, and just me and my mate bags uh, in the back. 
and we're like, right, what's going on? And we sort of didn't really know what was going on. Comms are pretty shit. Uh, Scotty didn't know we'd had a casualty. Uh, he was the vehicle commander. And he was like, I don't know, mate. The convoy's gone back, some sort of cars, and we are gonna we're gonna um, look after this vehicle here. <laughs> oh great. And it was just quiet at the time, nothing was going on, but it was just it started to get a bit eerie, and you know when you know it's gonna happen. Yeah, yeah. I felt that I was like it's gonna go off, stand by. And then we got hit with IDF in the city, like the rockets started coming in and mortars coming in on our position. Uh seen a local run past me with his dead son in his hands. Son was ash white, just where he'd been hit with a rocket. Uh-huh. And that was it. All hell just broke loose. And we just got hit from 360. And we were in that engagement for, for hours on end, just fighting it off on our own. Um, eventually, we got some support from a warrior unit from uh, the Royal Welsh. They came in. They were fighting up on, on one junction. And we were on this junction scrapping. And it was literally... From 25 meters to 300 meters out, they were using crowds to hide themselves. They were hitting us from all angles. They were coming up close range, 25 meters, where my driver was pulling pistols out of uh, out of his vehicle hatch, engaging. Wow. Um, totally, pre- pretty much surrounded, and just taking incoming in the middle of the afternoon. And yeah, it was f- it was full on. It was full on. I think I I used up my whole operational ammo. The two passengers that were with me, I used up all their ammo. Uh, and we used all the spare in the wagon that afternoon. And there was just three of us on the guns, just scrapping away, scrapping. Um, it was, yeah, it was it was an eye-opener for me. And it was what I, w- I went there for. I was in my element. I loved it. I mean, uh, it was full on. so just to pause you there, you, you were young men, um, not even 20, maybe some of you in your 20s. After this engagement, how long is it before you allow yourself to... Um, sort of think about what's happened you know mentally break down everything that could have happened and did happen it was it was that even to be fair um i was 27 at the time so i was like you know i was i was a man pretty much i was in my prime as a soldier 27 uh full screw um experience being in the battalion a while so uh, for me i was good to go uh what happened was we eventually we moved back to a a sort of like sort of um Safe location, yeah. On route, did some rooftop security. Yeah, we're good. Wait till dark. Got dark. Drove in. Got hit with an ID on the way back in. Oh. Which was great. Yeah, that that sort of shook me a little bit, and I was fatigued as well. Gets in, and then gets told that obviously Jez was dead. Um, oh. that that fucked me up for about I don't know. Um, I maybe drop on the floor. That I'd never felt like that before. Just the emotion of having my teammate, the guy who lives sleeps next door, sleeps facing me, um, was dead. Obviously, they went. There's been casualties. I went, yeah, I know. I've heard he casualties, you know, and all that. And like, no. And we got in thinking, well, yeah, we're going to tell some stories about being in this amazing shootout all day, just flat packing people all day, and then that just went out the window. Um, but to answer your question, I had to switch on straight away. I've got a bunch of, like you said, 19, 18, 19, 20 year olds looking at me. Going, what the fuck are we going to do now? One of the best guys in the company is dead on day on day eleven. Wow. How are we going to how are we going to cope? And it made me just switch on even more. Um, my reaction to it was bomb up, get out, get me mags bombs up now, get me weapon clean, and that's what I did. And I said to them all, "This is what you do. This is what we're here for. It's a massive shock, but this is this is our wake up call." And that guy, he'd sat with us before in Bulford. We sat a group of us, group of screws together, all like senior screws together who used to hang out. And we said, you know, we're going to take casualties and these guys need to wake up because, you know, it's like in the training prior to prior to deploying, you're picking people up constantly like, look, you should be ready by now. We're going yeah. and we're deploying soon. You're just still not ready. And we were like, mate, they'll only, they'll only wake up when people start getting killed. But you don't think it's going to be the best guy? No. You don't think it's going to be him? So that was a wake up call for me that fuck any one of us could get killed here. Cause I thought I was untouchable. Yeah. I'm, like, I'm too fast. I'm too good. You'll net, they'll never keep up with me. I know my job too well. And then to see me mate, who was just as good as me get killed like that in an ambush. I was like, Oh no. Um, I, it's, it's scary. It, yeah. It, it, it put a bit of fear into me as well. I was like, wow, this is real. Does the, does the fear keep the blade sharp? So to speak. 
Fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. It's it's just you've just got to overcome it and go. We know the risks now. We've seen it on day one, and it, that shock went round the battalion. Yeah. It really did. Um, he wasn't the only casualty that day. We had guys came back out to assist us. They got then hit in another ambush and got blown up. The vehicles destroyed. Drivers blown out the vehicle, fighting out on the floor. Wow. Uh, the game firing pistols at people close range as they've been blown out the hatch. They got eventually brought back in. So it that shockwave went round the battalion. Uh, it was a very connected tour. We lost some really smart people. On that tour, yeah, um, some good two two of them good mates, really good mates of mine, um, and it just made everyone sort of wake up and go, "Fuck, it's real, so it is real." And I didn't want to die. I had a kid at home, brand new kid, and a wife at home, and I was like, "I ain't fucking dying for no one." So my ass was moving when I was out on that on them streets, and at night time, I was moving with a purpose. Um, when we were in the vehicles, I was moving with a purpose. There was no messing about. Um, we were engaging people that we needed to engage and kill who we needed to kill. Wow. Yeah. Um, so that sounds like a very kinetic engagement for your first one in Iraq. Yeah. Um, then you progressed to Afghanistan. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, we went to Afghanistan and it was a total different vibe. I'd say. Huh? Uh, I was different as well. So right. I was a little bit older again, 2009, two years older. Yeah. And I, I, want, I wanted a different feel. Um, I've just been fighting in an urban environment. We're now going into a rural environment. Uh, yeah, rural farmland, Helmand Province, uh, Nadi Ali. Yeah. Um, and we were in vehicles. We are on foot now. So we're moving as multiples as a platoon in fighting patrols. Um, I had that little bit of smarts about me now. I didn't want to carry all. Initially, I started carrying everything because I knew what it's like to get in an engagement. And I knew I fired off every single round in that engagement. Uh -huh. I, like, I don't want to do that again. So I was packing on fucking like 16 mags of ammo I was carrying. And, right. and they're all bombed up. They're fully bombed up. That's not a bad couple of bandoliers. That's 16 mags carrying. And it becomes too much. You're carrying all sorts in the end. Start to slowly go, right, I'm a bit smarter now, a bit older. Do I need to be fired in 16 mags? I no. don't, do I? I don't. Um, I'm now on foot. There's a, a minimum of a multiple of us, so there's lots more rifles. So, yeah, I was a bit, I was a bit smarter there. It was a total different tour, I think. The vibe was different. We were living in a fob and not in a big base, so we were living in with two platoons of us together and a company HQ. And we had one platoon out in a platoon house. They had a great time because um, they were out further away, so they were they had some real good shootouts from the from the fob. But yeah, the whole vibe was different. I, I, I do. I think I want. To, didn't think I wanted to help anyone still because in Iraq I didn't speak to anybody. I never spoke to a local. Wow. I didn't speak to anyone. We're moving at fast pace. We're on the ground doing a job, hitting hitting things and then getting back. But here you're out on the ground. You, you're patrolling to the towns, into the village. So you're getting to speak to people and and see villages and kids, and that gives you a different outlook as well because you're seeing the people like it, what whose country it is. And don't get me wrong, we weren't, it was, we weren't mega hearts and minds or not at that stage. It was still we were out there to fight and find the Talibs. Yeah. Um, especially when you're going out into a company fighting patrol. We use some nice tactics, like we bring a, a female with us to get on the horn and call them out. And we'd all be in fighting positions ready to go. And it just antagonized them so we could have a fight. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was it was a good talk. It was good. Um, we lost the game. We lost... As a rifles regiment, we lost a few guys because it was quite kinetic that time, 2009. Sangin, we had guys up in Sangin. Um, and we had guys, Nad Ali South and Nad Ali North. So throughout the whole, I think two rifles and four rifles out at the same time we gained, we lost quite a few guys because Sangin and Nad Ali are quite kinetic. Wow. Uh, you were saying you were, you were carrying a, a lot of kit this time because you were on Foot. What sort of kit was it you were using this time around? You're still in your CS95 DPM desert. Uh, mixed cam. I was, I was a fan of mixed cams. Not like now where you've got a one dress. You can. We're in a fob. We wore what we want. Um, I'd always wore my own rigs anyway. So as long as I kept their plates and their frame for it, their soft inners, I'd always carried a, a recce rig over the sort of Osprey. Yeah. I never rated any of the British military kits. I thought it was absolutely awful. Um. 
we spend millions, billions investing in designing this kit when you can just buy look at just look at our American brothers and go, let's just wear that and yeah. buy it off them. You know, yeah. it's ridiculous. Uh, but that's another subject. <laughs> so at the time I was carrying a recce, a recce rig, lightweight. Um I'd have a uh, my normal rifle. Um SIG on my chest, on my chest plate, attached to my chest. Um a couple of a couple of frag, a couple of foss, all my mags, and then some of the mags are attached to my day sack. I have mag mag pouches on my day sack. Yeah. Obviously, your radio, your water, your food, your night vision. Uh, so Lucy sight for me night vision. Uh, spare radios, spare ammunition, 66. Um, yeah, it was, it was a bit of a load, like yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> especially for cutting rounds. You, you know, you're all you're on foot and you're in rivers, using rivers a lot to navigate. Obviously, the 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 IED threat's massive. So we, I tried to stay off roads. Just cut round the farm fields into ditches and use ditches and use streams to navigate, um, and it's better for concealment as well. Wow, what's uh, your most memorable um, things about that tour in Afghanistan? What sticks in your mind the most? Uh, those, um, the most. It's not even the shootouts. Not even the shootouts. Uh, oh no, I'll tell you. Oh, I'll tell you a good one. So. It was a shootout. So I'm about to leave. I've I decided prior to going on the tour, I was going to call it a day on the mill. And I'd signed off. And I would make my, dis in my head, I was like, if I, if I enjoy this tour, um, I'll stay and I can cancel it. I'd just done senior Brecon. Um, and finished seniors, went straight out on the tour with the, with the, with the battalion. And I was about to go on to leave the tour about a month early because my CP course was booked for the October. Yeah. So about two weeks before my CP course was booked, my flight's coming in. I'm like, got my flight date. I'm buzzing. And it's going off the next day. I'm like, yes, mate. I'm in my shorts. I've cut down my shorts to as small as I can be. <laughs> my balls are threatening to hang out. <laughs> They're that high up for me, Tan. I'm chilling. I've got my bandana on. My hair's grown out long. I'm, I'm, I'm buzzing. Full tan on. And then so I've handed in all my grenades, my pistols, my nods, everything in. And then they go, <laughs> me, me platoon commander comes and goes, dude, your flight's been cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> and the company were doing a five day off and I was fuming. I went, fuck you lot. I ain't going. <laughs> He's like, dude, we need you on the patrol. We need you to lead the company. Uh, you're going to lead the clearance, the, the clearance um, team. So it's two teams. You're going to lead it. And you're going to lead the whole company down. And we're going to establish a fob to five day off. We'll get you out back out in five days. So it's about a three day patrol, and then two days establish and start building. Get the engineers in, but they had to clear the route down there. I was, I was snapped, man. I was like, "Fuck!" You know, because I'd switched off, and I had switched off at that stage. The yeah. flight was in the next day, and I was chilling. So I quickly ran round, scrambled all my gear back, prepared for the patrol. Uh, we left zero dark. And I'm leading this two man. I've got my two IC on one side of the road. He's an extended line. We've got the, the mocking beards on. He's got them on the left. I've got them on the right in IR so I can see the line that we can clear. <coughs> We've then got a road team clearing the road. I'm clearing left and right to the road in extended line, like just as in, like an advance to contact. But wait, how many? So eight, eight with me, eight the other side. Pretty much, I led them like it's like a small multiple. And I'm in the middle, pretty much on the road, so I can lead after two teams. I have another two IC with me, uh, Lance Jack. Um, and he was sort of commanding the guys, and I just commanded the two elements. So I'm leading this down, and we're moving at a bit of a pace, and it's dark. Obviously, the road team are dealing with IEDs as well. So we felt, mate, we were about a K ahead, <laughs> like a K on our own, like 16 dudes. So we get told to halt, so we, we have a little layup. And then we get an additional task. We're going to bring a, 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 a marine call sign, Royal Marine call sign. They had, um, I don't know, if they were Vikings. They had some Vikings. We're going to bring some Vikings. We're going to put some Vikings out for flank protection for the company. Can you find a crossing point in the river? Perfect. I'm up for that. Let's do that. So I gave them where I was, and we're at a little village. So no one is a village. There's bound to be a crossing point. Um, I went, well, I'm going to go and clear this village with eight guys. 
And they're like, yeah, cool. So I found the crossing point, sent the grid, send that vehicle to me. I'll let me clear the village first so it doesn't get engaged in the village. And you know, again, I mentioned it in Iraq, that shit goes off in your head, you know. Yeah. And I seen the motorbikes, two motorbikes whizzing off as soon as they see me. So I got the guys right, stand by, stand by, we're going to get contact here. And the moment I, I had them in extended line and we're pushing around the corner and it just lit up close range. So all the grounds like, yeah, AK, whatever it was, PKM, just lighting the floor up. We all hit the deck, rapid rate of fire down. And then we start peeling the guys to my left, seeing a ditch. So I'm just like, one by one, peel off, rapid fire. We start peeling off. We all get in this ditch. So I'll call contact report in, tell the company where I am. So the company now, I am now the main, I'm now the main objective. Now get in, support me. So but there's a village behind me. I'm looking past the village now with a bunch of compounds. And I could see where I where we were against from. It was only 35 meters away. So we start putting rapid fire down on that and organizing ourselves to do a quick assault. Um, we had um, a ditch and a bun line full of water going down and leading towards it. So I got me in man link man to link in with the rest of the company. And then I led off. Uh, well, I had my guy um, on the valent lead off through the ditch and we jumped in, done a quick assault. We didn't engage in the end. We didn't need to use the frags. No one was there on the position. He, he bugged out in quick time. So the company were doing like a an amber assault. So it, we weren't going live straight away. They yeah. were clearing through. They cleared through. My platoon met me, called me back. I met them to do an assault on this, uh, an amber assault on this, on this, on this sort of compound and building. So we went in, we cleared it, got the women and children, pushed them to the side, grabbed the old men. Boss is starting to interrogate, or not interrogate, question them. <laughs> And we like we started taking incoming from the area where I'd just been, and just area past about about 120 meters, I'd say, to another from another compound. So we bring the sniper up, put the sniper on the roof. He's looking into depth, and I jump on the roof for him. But as I'm climbing on the roof, I rip my fucking pants, man. I've got no <laughs> underpants on, so my fucking cock and balls are all hanging out. <laughs> now I've been wearing these like five months, so I've got my jungle tropper, my jungle that I've had my jungle shirt on. And my desert bottoms on, and my desert bottoms are split, and my whole cock and balls are hanging out. I got the sniper on the roof with me, the company commander, and my boss. I'm like, dudes, check it out. And the fucking my OC is like, mate, you're nuts. I'm like, what can I do? As we're doing that, and as we're laughing, I seen a guy pop up on the compound. So the sniper's sort of, he's, I'm, I'm to the right of the sniper, he's looking in one direction. I look over his barrel. And rather than get him to turn it as I took too long, I just went up into the kneeling. Yeah, just took the shot, walking two rounds, hit this guy, dropped him. Um, and we believe it was the commander because all the ICOM chat had been off. Because wow. we had loads of ICOM coming over and he was the guy directing what the fucking the shitheads were doing. But after that shot, them two shots, there was no more ICOM. So hopefully it was the ICOM commander um, with a bit of luck. But I got my shoe fan with my cock and balls hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many of them are lying, how many stories like that are floating about. But yeah, it was a it was a bit of a laugh then. I was like, check that out. That's my most memorable memory, I think. Um so as you said, you decided to do some CP work. Um, like you've just explained, your flight was delayed. And um, so you head back to the UK, do your CP training. Did you have thoughts in mind thinking CP work was going to be less kinetic than what it had been in the armed forces. Yeah, definitely. I had mates who were, who were doing it. Um, we had CP lads in our fob living with us. Yeah. So one of the roles that the, the, the company I went to work for, one of their roles was a support role for the military uh, or they work with the military. So, or oh, should I phrase this, the military would support them. So wow. if one of these guys would need to go somewhere and do some um, stabilization, because he'd be working with what's called a stabilization officer, who would work for the government, British government. The CP operator would take them out. We would provide support with firepower and take them out on a patrol. And that guy then would work with the with the civilian, the British civilian, and they would do all the stabilization effort. CP operator would provide close protection, and the the, the infantry or slot would be providing the outer support for them. 
So I sort of knew that it can be kinetic. Yeah. But two of my mates, two of my very good mates were were deputy uh, team leaders on the contract that I wanted to get on. Um, luckily for me, I interviewed well and I got with the company who was doing that role and I jumped on their team in Helmand. Um, the day I left the military was the day I flew to Kabul. Wow. So I was on the flight that morning at like 11 o'clock. I'm out the army, but I was on the flight flying out. Um, wow. I got to Kabul, did a, few, a little induction package and then flew straight down to Helmand and joined the teams in Helmand. Wow. So, so out of Afghanistan, October, Straight back in. February, I was back in. Left, wow. in. left in the end of October. February, I was back in as a civilian, and I loved it. It was great. Um, as a civilian contractor, then, how does your kit differ from the military, then? Because obviously, you need some sort of protection, some sort of ballistics. How does it differ? Um, I went and bought my own plate carrier. So, level three plates. They're a lot smaller than what the Osprey ones are, big chunky things. Some guys were using steel, whatever, uh, or ceramic Kevlar. So I think mine was the ceramic plates, I think, uh, level three, up to level three. So it's stopping at AK-47. It's still going to take the wind out here, but it's stopping that bullet go through. And I just took the, they issued you with um, like a blue armor. It's what like you see the TV, you know, the press wear. Yeah, yeah. All we do, strip the inners out. I put it into a in my own plate carrier, put the inners in, put my plates in. I had a green military style plate carrier with all the molly on. Uh, a gun belt. I think we had a started off with a G36, then I switched it to HK53. Um, it was 53s in the armory, so I took one of them. I modified that myself. I had an EOTech and an ACOG that I bought in country. I jumped online and bought my own. Uh, handguard, so a, a Picatinny rail handguard for the 53. Some dual, some uh, double caps, double, uh, double, double mag clips, yeah. so I could double my mags up. Um, I'd ended up working in one of the outstation in Marja with US Marine Corps, and I had the basic 53 with irons and got into a shootout um, with the Marines. I did a, an extraction with my client, uh, left the Marines to fight. Um, we moved back on foot back to the FOB. And then we had a few fob camp attacks as well. And I'm, I'm on the roof with the US Marines and they've got ACOGs and I'm with irons. And I'm like, I'm fucking useless here. So unless it's like close range, 25 meters, the irons were no good. So I sourced out my own gear and just modified the weapon and just got the armorer to check it over that he was happy. Yeah. Um, and he was happy. So I tricked out a 53, pretty sweet, to be fair. I took the ACOG off when I was in, when I was working in Lashkagar, I just used the EOTech. For close range CQB stuff. And which yeah. EOTech was that? 5.52 or? Which, sorry? Which EOTech was that? 5.52 or the slightly smaller? No, the 5.52, the older yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. The longer. Yeah, yeah. Normal batteries in. Yeah. Yeah. And it was pretty sweet. Did the job for me. Um, remember, if we do get an engagement, if you are in the city and you get an engagement, it's all going to be close. It's, it's in, it's in like in the vicinity of a building. When I was in the outstation, it was different. Um, you're out on patrol, just like in the mill then. So you're on foot patrol. So you need that longer range. So I had an ACOG for that. Yeah. So it was, it was pretty good. Um, the job was really cool. You're either in your teams. So four, four car moves, providing, you know, a big security profile. Or you got Taskins to work solo or in pairs in the outstations with the military. And some guys don't like that. I liked it. Um, you, you sort of left to your own devices. Um, the, the the calls down to you, so all the security uh, protocols are down to you. All this, all the all the report writing prior to going. So we're in the military. You do a recce patrol after the patrol. You'd have to do a recce patrol. Uh, you'd have to do a recce patrol prior to going out. So you yeah. look at all the intelligence, link in with the mill, what intelligence they have. Speak to the locals, what intelligence they have. Look at what's been going on in the area and then put a patrol report together to go, right, this job should go ahead, and you green light it or red light it, and then you'd send that up to your boss, and then they would, off your back, off your call, they would tell them the stabilisation officer, yeah, you can go out, because he's telling you what I want, this is what I need to achieve my aim, and you're there to support him. So some people are not confident with sitting in a room with a major, as a civilian, with a major and a captain, 
and going, this is what I want. I need your company and your platoon to do this for me. Some people are not used to doing that. So for me, it was sound. I was happy to do it. So, yeah, it's pretty good. How does the mindset differ from military work to CP work? No difference. Keep the same no. mindset. Remember, you're not there to, to fight with people at all. Um, all the skills and drills I used were everything that I learned in the military. It was just adapted for, for the CP way, the CP world. The tactics are, are slightly different. You're still doing an extraction. You do the same in a recce platoon. So you're doing a four man extraction drill. Well, you do the same thing in CP because you're there to extract. Yeah. So all you're doing is adapting it to the type of vehicles now. But well, we, we have now B6 armored Land, Ro uh, armored Land Rovers. So now you're just learning how to extract a person from one vehicle to another and extract back. It's 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 piece of piss for anyone who's who's been in the mill and done sort of like infantry work or some sort of commando role or you know whatever. It's it's very easy, but the mindset's the same. Um, you're there to protect people instead of being offensive, though. That's it. Um, how kinetic did it get for you when you uh, went back to Kabul? Um, we had a couple of little mini like, small little engagements in in Helmand, in Helmand. Nothing to write home about. Little couple of little extractions, but. <laughs> I joined. I'd, I'd lost my job basically. So when the when Brit Mill had pulled out of Afghan, um, pulled out of Helmen, sorry, then there was no need for us to be there because we were there to, as a support element for that, as the reconstruction team. So a load of lads had either left before, but I opted to stay. I went, well, I'll stay and see the contract out because they needed for that, and I thought that will put me in good favour with the company. So a load of lads went to Iraq. We already had a bunch of guys going to Somalia to set up the gig out there in Somalia for the embassy. So they're gone. So we're already dropping down in numbers. And I went, well, I'm happy to stay. I'll see you out and then, you know, sort of hope for the best and see if there's something for me. And there wasn't. I got up to Kabul and I got issued my end of contract. And he said, look, if something comes up, we'll give you a shout. And I'd never asked nothing from anyone. Uh, I was a team leader at the time in Helmand. I did a little stint as the... As the as the personal bodyguard for the head of mission, wow. um, so I was experienced. And I'm like, right, okay, I'm gonna have to ask for help here. I started calling some of my buds up on smaller contracts, going as the N and about. That night, as I'm making this call, the contracts manager came in and he's like, "John, have you found a job yet?" I'm like, "No." He goes, "Do you want one?" And I'm like, "Yes." <laughs> and he goes, "Right, come down to the office. We've got an opportunity for you." Um, I was offered the role to run. Sorry? No, no, carry on. I was offered the role to, to start up my own contract, brand new, not being set up yet. We were to look after an organization, a high profile organization, and I was to go in and set it all up for them. Um, but I'd be working alone. Wow. And I jumped at it. Uh, man, I didn't even listen to what <laughs> he was saying. I just had a job and I went, yeah. I'd had about three months worth of money in the bank. Like anybody, you're living that three months, that's all you're doing. And um, don't get me wrong, we were well paid, but I was living it too, so I was spending it. So I had about three months, it was Christmas time, and I just all I heard was job. And it would have been in it and I'd have done it. I just went, yeah. And then when he sat me down and he told me the, the brief on the job, I thought, what an opportunity. This will be amazing. Um, I felt confident enough to work on my own. I thought 13 years in the military, just spent three years in Helmand working in big teams. I understand my job now, and yeah, I'm a I'm a professional at this job too now, and I jumped at the chance. Um, but you mentioned that, when did it get kinetic? Well, it got kinetic about 11 days in. Um, it took either seven day breathing space before my boss, who I was to work for, was coming in. He was on leave, so I did seven days of recce's. I found out where he was going, where he liked to go, where he worked. And where he liked to entertain himself. Remember, this guy's a civilian. It's not, yeah. it's not embassy now, so there's, he doesn't have them rules. So I went and did all my reckies, and that's just that's just me on my own. I had a MP5 in a, in a laptop bag, me pistol concealed carry, and I had the M4 in my car, and I had a local driver to take me out. And I just go on the ground, and I just right, I'm here. I've got a client coming in. Can I have a quick check? Do me reconnaissance, write my reports. Get him in, get him sent up to Washington. I was working direct to Washington stage and I had a link to my company I work for in Kabul. Wow. Um, seven days in, 
I'd done the recce on where he liked to go, where he liked to sort of socialise, and it was called the Taverna Restaurant. And I immediately put it out of bounds. I went, that is dodgy as fuck. We're not going there. There's no support. It's on a back street. There's no blast walls. There's a blast door. That's it. My vehicle stands out. I've got, I've got, um, I've got diplomatic plates on the car, so I stand out. I'm not doing that. There's no way. And my role wasn't a CP role either, but I knew he'd want that. Yeah. I, I was there as a security advisor and to do all the planning for him, do all the reconnaissance. So when I met him, I told him my concerns and immediately he was like, mate, we need to have another talk because I'm not happy. And I was always told, if you go commercial, you've got to do as you say. Yeah. It's not like government contracts. We pull jobs all the time. Too dangerous, we're going. We're a government contract. We can, we're keeping you safe. Commercial contract, if the client wants to get rid of you, he'll just get rid of you and get someone else in. He'll say yes. So I was always aware of that, but I thought I am not going to go against my values here and my professional knowledge. And I said, well, look, we're going to have to discuss it another time. I reported it up, did my report, told them it should be out of bounds. So that sort of saved me a little bit. Uh, day 11, I was eating over at British Embassy. Um, came back and I see my driver coming in. I'm like, where have you been? Julio, you know, what have you been doing? You're not booked out. Why haven't you booked out? And we thought oh, the boss wanted to go out for a meal. As he says that, I'm like, give him a call, find out where he is. I'm going to go and get him. Say, come, get home. Or at least get there and be ready to pick him up and bring him back. As I'm on the phone trying to ring him, just a, a, a loud bang went off. Wow. About, about 300 meters away, if that. And I was like, fuck, no answer on the phone. Quickly ran up, grabbed my armor, grabbed my M4, jumped in the car, went to my driver, fucking go, get me there now. The embassy gates had closed, obviously security threat. I'm like, get the fucking door open, get the gate open, I'm going out. So I got the gate open, went out, parked at the end of the road, told my driver to wait there, pitch black at night. And I start just weapon up now, just walking down towards this contact that's going off, going, what am I doing? <laughs> what am I doing? I'm on my own in fucking Kabul. I don't even know the city. I'm fucking, and I'm fucking walking down the street with an M4 at the ready. Going, what the fuck? And it's pitch black. Pitch black. Uh, no nods. No nod capability. Not all that. So took a bit of cover. Jumped on the phone. Reported in. Um, my contact, my sort of security manager, contracts manager who was working with me, he said, I'll try and get you some support. And he, he phoned up two guys and them two guys, mate, fair play. They stood two and drove down, but they couldn't get in. Accord, the police had started blocking stuff off. Linked up with a policeman. I said, let's fucking go. Come on, let's go. And he, he was having none of it. He's like, no way. And I had to wear. I just did a combat assessment. Combat estimate, sorry. What do I do? I'm on my own. Don't know how many there is. Am I going to get hit from behind by police and, or, or what? By the time I'm making this, doing, doing my combat estimate, the police sort of rock up behind me. And... Next minute, triple two came, which is the Afghan SF. Yeah. They came, and I was sort of then put out of action. There's nothing you can do. Um, but I tried to stay in the game, so I sort of blagged it. I was like, "Well, I'm a doctor, cause I had my big red med bag on me back." I said, "I, I had me, I kept me British Embassy ID card from Helmand. I thought that might get me out of trouble one day. That cause it's got Embassy, they won't see Helmand on it." And I went, "I'm a doctor for the Embassy over the road," and they went, "Stay with us, great." So I managed to get in behind the assault. Uh, unfortunately, it was too late. Everyone was dead. 22 executed. Wow. Um, so I just did the repat. I just did the evacuation of all the bodies. Found my client. Found two other guys I knew there who were staying at my villa. Everyone executed close range. Women, kids, women, families, and a load of expats. Oh, a load of, I just I worked with the Afghans then. I was the only sort of... There was a couple. There was another guy with me, an Italian guy. He was doing similar for his company. Um, he did his little bit. Uh, I did mine. I did all mine. Got everyone just sort of evacuated. He assisted me and, and, and stuff. He got his guy out who he needed to get, and I just dealt with all the. I just got all the passports together. Russian embassy, British embassy, Canadian embassy. Got all them involved, and then just got the bodies taken out um, and identified. So it was a rough one. It was a rough one, and it was an eye opener for working on your own in a hostile environment. It was, yeah, eleven days in dealing with that. Wow. How did that um, affect your confidence? Um, it didn't. I realised I realised I'm good at making decisions. 
Yeah. Because I told him not to go, and, I, I, and my decision making was sound, and I would not have went with him that night, even if he'd have pulled me. I mean, come on. I'd already told him the reasons why. I'd give him a list of fundamental reasons why there's a security risk at this place. Yeah. Um, and mainly, is it's a, it's a well known spot. There's no security. I can't be there to assist you. And also, when I went in on me recce, they wanted me weapons off me, and they go in a secure spot, and then they they they. So I'm like, I'm having to blag it and hide weapons on me and stuff like that. So it was just a massive no no. It had red flags everywhere. Luckily for me, prior to him arriving, I'd already recce'd it and give it a big no. I had the recce report dated, signed, and dated saying no, this yeah. is out of bounds. So it didn't. It made me more confident that I'm, I, I can do this. I, I stayed on the contract for a year, providing support for the company, the organization, um, and did the same thing for a year. Flying People are flying. I'd, I'd make sure they were sorted out. Um, and luckily for us, there was no other. But it made such an impact because he was the head of the organization. Wow. That in the end, he pulled out. There was just too much, too much danger going on in the city at the time. Um, I thought Helmand was kinetic, but Kabul was getting worse and worse. It was so dangerous to be around. And on your own, my 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 support was me phoning someone. That was my support. Wow. And the next after that incident, my support was I would phone up uh, a local ops room that the company was using in our in in a, in our company's base because I was subcontracted out basically. I'm out living in a villa. So I would when the local when the local CP team would go out, they had their own ops room. I would phone them and speak to a Nepalese guy, a Nepalese guard force, and go, It's John. Yeah, I'm going out and I'll call you when I'm there and I'll call you when I go back. Mobile phone. That was it. Wow. How was it taking a, a QRF to get to you? Um but we had guys, guys from another uh, commercial contract came to you know offered to come to my aid that night. Jumped in cars straight away. They're only 300 meters away, but they got they weren't allowed in. And yeah. I just said, go back. It's it's dangerous on the outer cordon. So that's why I stayed in within the inner cordon. Yeah. So I thought there's going to be a secondary, it'll be on the outer. I know the TTP, I know what it is. So I said, you pull out because you might get it. Um and they were great then two lads, but anywhere else, rest of that city, it could have been anywhere. If I get hit, I've got to be conscious enough to make a phone call because I haven't got a radio. Um I haven't got a tracker. I'd organised, I brought people in um, from Dubai to settle trackers for me on my vehicles and on my personal and on my phone. Um, I brought them in. That was get, I was in the mode of setting them up to get the vehicles kitted out with trackers and stuff. But yeah, it would have took ages for anyone, if, even if they knew I'd been hit. I'm cutting rounds just on a mobile phone. That was it. Wow. Um, something you've said to me uh, previously was... Um... You got shot in the hand by some dude. Yeah. So when we talked to you, like any significant incidents happen, oh, I got shot in the hand. Yeah. Um, that that was sort of my the end of my contracting career. Yeah. Um, sort of retired from that then, and and it is a career. You're doing it for ten years, it becomes your career. Yeah. Um. I, once that contract ended, they looked after me. The company I did a good job there, so they brought me on the teams in Kabul. I came out back as an operator, just so just on the teams as a guy, and I was so thankful of that. I've been running my own contract for a year with the pressures of running your own contract and working alone. It was great to be back with a team. Um, the city was extremely kinetic at the time. Within, I think, two weeks of me joining the team, we lost one of our teammates. Um, he got hit in an IED, um, and I was not happy with the SSOPs that we were using. We were using one-car moves. I knew I took that risk as a contractor working on a commercial contract, I was getting paid more, so I knew the risk. But we were doing it now on the sort of government contract, and I was like, this is silly. If we get hit, mate, no one's coming. It's going to take ages. You can't get the cities rammed. It's chocker. And you're telling me, I understand you, well, we have a QRF now. It's great, yeah. How can the QRF get to us when the traffic, the moment something goes off, cordons go in place, traffic stops, QRF ain't coming. You're on your own, doing it yourselves. So you need to be at least two vehicles minimum. And unfortunately for us, we hadn't got to that stage. And one of our team, one of my team, my new teammates, he was killed um, in an ID. And he was, he was a good lad, great operator, knew his job inside out. I, I just, it was one of them unfortunate things. The blast doesn't care. Um, 
is is Oppo in the vehicle survived and did an amazing job till the QRF eventually did come. Luckily, they weren't too far away from support. Um, he did an amazing job injured, you know, sort of organising himself and, and everyone else on that day. Brilliant guy he is. Um, so then the SSOP changed now. We now go out with minimum two vehicles. Um, I then joined, the, the, like I said, I was in the teams then. And nothing really happened within our teams. All pretty safe. Um, we then get my vehicle again gets blown up. So we could see things started to escalate. I'm out on a two-vehicle move. I get hit. I was driving that vehicle. Luckily for us, no major damage. The SSOPs work. Let's go, go, go. We get back. But we could see it starting to build up. Now the threat was building up. A teammate of mine, what my best mate, his vehicle then gets hit literally 70 meters outside our patrol base. Wow. So we we live in a in a compound. It's secured by local nationals. Internally, it's secured by uh, Gaker Guard Force, and then the CP teams live in there. We have a training team in there, and my teammate, best mate in the world. I've known him from being in the Green Jackets together. I was his best man at his wedding. He's my boy. He drives out, mate, 70 metres. His call sign gets hit straight on our dirt road. So they knew where we were now. It, it all indicated we'd had a we'd had a stand-to period about two weeks, I'd say two weeks before we got hit in the camp. We stood to, instead, said it was going to be a camp attack. So we all stood to for about three or four nights, 24 hours. We have a QRF internally. Um, those guys are on standby 24-7. It's a sleeping duty nearby, but they're ready to go. Um, if the yeah. teams are out, they're on standby. The cars are loaded. They're ready to go to react. If the camp gets hit, they then become the breach team to, to go and do a counter attack at the breach. Um, nothing happened. So we're all, you know, you know, it's like my four nights of not sleeping properly. You're fucking, you're doing stand two or four in the morning. You're pissed off, aren't you? Like, yeah. this is shit. We need to have a stand down here. And we stood down. And then the night, I think it was the 18th of November. Yeah, 18th of November. Normal routine in the cookhouse with the guys, with our teams. Have food. Go to the the, the dobe, so the washroom, where the washroom, where you get all your uniforms, or your, your clothes washed. Goes there to collect me washing with me mate Jay. And I walk out. I'm QRF commander on that night. Um, I walk out with the wash bag and the whole world just lit up right in front of me. I actually thought we'd been hit by a rocket that landed close and the flash just hit me. It blew me back into the building and the building on top of me, half the roof on top of me. Wow. Um, it was one of the guys who works in that washroom was lifting me, lifting the shit off me. He's like, you all right, Mr. John, you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. I'm, I'm good. And starts checking myself, pistols there. I've lost my radio. Don't know where the fuck that was. Um, Pulled my phone out of my pocket, put my torch on because all the lights in the camp went off. Um, and it was pitch black. I think it was about I think about half six, quarter to seven that night, roughly. You'd have to you'd have to find out. About half six, I think it was. So I'm like, where's Jay? So fuck. So I put my torch on my phone. I'm looking for Jay. Nowhere to be seen. I'm like, fuck, he's been vaporized. And I've known uh, Major Harden from Four Rifles. He was hit when a, a rocket landed next to him. And that took him completely out, obviously. So I knew of that, and that was in my head. And I'm like, shit, Jay's gone. And I'm searching for him. He's nowhere to be seen. There's no marks of a body or nothing. So I'm like, motherfucker, he's gone back. <laughs> so I quickly run back to my room, um, conscious that I haven't got a radio on the QRF commander. Throw me plate, car throw me plate on, helmet on, grab me rifle, grab me, uh, me belt kit, put me belt kit with all my mags on, first aid kit. And I go out and meet our team leader. So I meet this meet our team leader. Um, I won't mention who it is because you may not want me to, but mention the team leader. He's the top guy, mate, like proper solid dude, ex paratrooper. Fucking love working with him. Meets him and he's like, fuck man, is everyone all right? I'm like, I don't know, Nick. I got blown out. Um, I said, but I think it was a rocket attack. He's like, mate, I don't know. It sounded like an ID. It was massive. I'm like, I don't know. But I'm preparing for like a clearance of the camp. That was my mindset on it. My two QRF guys, they came. One had an LMG, one's got his rifle, and the, the fourth guy failed to show. I won't mention his name. Um, I've no love for this guy, only hate. Um, he never showed up. 
So we had another. We, we then moved to this to our formal up point with all the team leaders get in the QRF commander. Um, we get in and we're doing a quick head, quick between us, right? What are we going to do? Um, I went, I think it's an I, a rocket. Like, nah, it sounded like an ID. What the fuck was it? Got no power. And then next minute, you can hear the AKs going off. And we just looked at each other with bright eyes and went, fuck camp attack. Wow. My fourth guy hadn't shown yet. And great guy, uh, one of the commit, one of the managers of the company, he was in his shorts and flip flops and t shirt. He had no armor on, no not, and he'd just been in the fucking just have his dinner. And he went, took the LMG, strapped it on. And he goes, I'll be your fourth guy. What a guy. Love this guy. And I was like, dude, no, you're needed here. We need you in the middle, command and everything. So I'll give it back to me, boy, uh, one of my teammates. And I just said to, to my team leader, right, you're good. You did it in a security. I'll go to the beach, find these fuckers and, and fight them to give us a bit of breathing space. And he's like, all right, see you later, dude. I looked at the other two. I said, you're good to go. And they went, we're good to go. No nods, no not in pitch black. Smoke everywhere. Uh, fucking scary. Yeah. But full of confidence. I was full of confidence. We there's a good few of us who do a lot of training. Um, we have a skills house there. We've got the sim weapons. We train for CQB. Low light, no light. Uh, just a small core group of us who would do that, just to be good at what we do. I'd recently just wrote a paper on why everybody needs to do this training, and that I've been that we've been doing. Been doing this since Helmand, and I sent it up. Uh, up the chain and I'm waiting for a reply to go yeah let's make it part of normal training so I, I'm confident in my skills and I'm leading the point man walking up one of the sort of alleyways in the camp and get opened up on from about 25 metres away just see the muzzle flash so I return fire straight away sidestep into a bit of cover the cover's prefab metal so it's not really cover but let's go through prefab metal um, but you feel very confident hiding behind it. <laughs> You're like, yeah, man, I'm hiding. It's a, it's not cover from fire. It's only cover from view. So I come out, pop my head out, retain fire, and then my whole world, mate, I just got like a mag of auto. It must have been a mag of auto come at me. And I was like, holy shit. And I, I could feel it. I could feel it. And it, I was like, fuck me. And I had to take cover again. I couldn't retain fire. And I looked behind me and the wall was like that, the holes in the prefab, I could see them. And the two guys, and I giggled, I looked at the guy, I went, look at that. And, they were, and one of the guys went, he goes, fuck this. I ain't getting paid for this. And I went, dude, it's too late, you're in the mix, let's go. And he was like, yeah, it was good. So jumped out, retained fire again. Um, and then it died off, so I checked fire. So I had to make another move because I have to push towards where that was, start clearing. Yeah. And then a body just come running at me, fast pace. Uh, I was like, stand by, stand by. And I think we had about 10 metres of, like, really good vis. But remember, it's still dark, pitch black. Yeah. 10 metres to where it's like, it was struggling here because of all the, the, the mist, the smoke. Um, and it was a Nepalese guy. Now, they guys, they all have the green lights too. We get green lights for our rigs and helmets to identify us, but none of us use them. We're like, no, because we're showing everyone else where we are. Yeah. Um, but all them are meant to wear it. So I'm scanning this guy, got the weapon up, I'm about to pull the trigger. Safety comes off, trick, prep the trigger, and he gets into the 10-meter range, safety back on, finger off the trigger. And it was a Nepalese guy just running for his life. Um, next set, another guy comes. I'm like, shit. But all, it, all that's in your head is suicide bomber running in yeah. to set himself off. Fucking scanning again. <laughs> safety off, trigger pressure, about to fire, safety back on, check fire, check fire. Fucking hell. So I'm a, you know, you're like, it made me think. I had to start thinking as well. Because you know what it's like? You get into that shoot and everything becomes like, I'm just going to, we're just killing people now, let's go. Yeah. And it made me check and go, right, no, we've got clients in here. We've got Nepalese guys and Afghans who are not armed, who might be dazed and confused and are running around. That adds an element of, of a massive amount of a, a massive amount of question in your head, split seconds. You've got to be good. And we're not using nods. We've got no nod capability, so it's even harder now. So I'm about to step off the line to move forward again, and someone just walked in front of me, ten meters left to right. I tracked them, seen the weapon, yeah, in a little bit of light, seen the weapon up, 
engage them one, two, three, bam, bam, bam. Um, as I engaged them, I just felt something hit me, um, and it wasn't from him. Wow. I just took, I, I had to stay because I was out at the moment. I took that step off, about to take step off. I had to t- come back in behind the cover, and I just I knew I'd been shot. I just looked down, I was like, ah, oh, fuck's sake, my, my finger was hanging off completely just by a bit of skin. My little finger was like, like, quarter of that was off, and then I had a big wound in the middle, um, and all my hand was messed up, bloody. And so I just looked at that hanging there, that was my firing hand. So, what had happened, the round had come in underneath my armpit and hit the pistol grip as I was firing. So, as I landed my third shot, I got hit then, and it must have been all I can think of, it was his oppo to my left, who we didn't see. And even my teammate, he was in the prone on the LMG. He'd been rattling off like a gangster. Um, he didn't, he, he, not on that engagement, but left to right. But he didn't see no one either. The visibility was so poor. So all I can think of is they were moving in a pair. And as you he, as he see my muzzle flash, he's just boom, put a base down at me. Um, all next to me was like those holes as well next to me. So um, that's what happened there. I took a step back, quickly checked it. I was like, all right, switch, put my weapon down into the cradle in the other hand. But remember, I didn't have a radio, so I've been I've been using the guy's comms because mine had gone. Um picked up me, we couldn't get comms. The comms were terrible on the radios that we had. These were new radios, they were awful. He never worked in camp. So fuck it, I'll phone him. So <laughs> and as I phone one of these shitty motor rollers. The light comes on on the Motorola. And my face lights <laughs> up. It's pitch black. I mean, mate, he's like, dude, turn your fucking phone off, man. You're lighting us up. I'm like, fuck, okay. So I'm like, right, let's clear this building, and we will, we'll, we'll take over there. Sort my first aid out, and we'll get comms. Um, my two teammate one stayed on the ground. The NMG. The other guy, he went point man. He went up the stairs, and it's trashed. Like the the camp was trashed. Five thousand pounds a hit it. That's what it was. That was the initial blast, um, and then it was a four man assault team came in to do, to do everyone. So he goes up. He clears the top floor with me. I'm obviously with one hand now as well. Um, we bring our third man up. He he covered our move. He stayed on the bottom on his own with his LMG gangster. He comes up, secure a room, and give me jumped off the phone, and got comms and said, "Look, I'm man down. This is where I am." Um, but as I'm on the phone, I started to feel an element of shock. Yeah, I didn't know what that was. Never felt that before. Felt my body going to a bit of shock. Ooh, everything felt a bit, a bit woozy, uh, a bit jittery, and I was like, "Shit!" So I passed the phone over. It's like you best talk. I don't know what the fuck I'm going to say here. Handed the phone over. Started doing self aids on myself. Just obviously, I carry on my kit, my first aid kit, me, me, me bandages and stuff. So I did a combat bandage around my hands, wrapped it all up, got it good to go. And I got the phone back and it was like picked up the phone again and he's like fucking you need to stay on the phone man he's a fucking idiot <laughs> and he's not he was just conf- he just got confused he was a new guy in the team and he didn't know all the numbers and the codes for each building yeah so i gave him what code i was in give him an indicator for us for the guys and he went right someone's coming for you um my two best mates in the world the guy who was hitting that id and the other best mate they them two came and cleared up to me on their own solo so they, they moved through, got to me, we secured that building then. And our guy, uh, Dan, who was with me, he had two engagements from the second floor. So he's like downstairs below us. And we were next to a bunker. And they had, what they'd had, they had the satchel chargers on them to blow the bunkers. Um, they'd already had a recce, they'd had a, an insider inside the camp. They'd done a recce on it. Uh, they'd had a film so they knew where everyone was. So they were going to them points. Um, and Dan engaged them from above. Um, so that was three. I hit one, first one. He was then engaged by an LMG gunner from another team. So the pair of us had smashed him up. And then Dan had done two um, from above, which was pretty cool. But the guy wouldn't die. He kept on throwing grenades at us. We were getting grenades lobbed at us for about an hour, this little fucker. Um, so what we did, we just... Because we now got call signs everywhere, we haven't got night vision capability, we don't know how many there is. The best option was let's lock in and we're in fighting positions. They'll come to us, we'll kill them. Yeah. And we've sort of accounted for everyone, everyone sort of came in as they should. Um, unfortunately for us, we've lost our teammate Luke. 
um, in the uh, I've been engaged. They've been an engagement behind me as I was in my engagement. One of the one of them had come around the back um, after engaging me, come around the back of me, and then got engaged with the main team. Um, unfortunately, he was all fired and putting and putting uh, rounds down onto target, and he got hit. And unfortunately, it was fatal. So the guys told me that when they came up to me, they said, "Listen, mate, bad news." But you, there's not, and you can't dwell on it. It's like, okay, put it to bed, and let's carry on with this task. I think it took about ten hours to clear the, the whole camp. We ended up bringing in SF, uh, Afghan with Brit, uh, Afghan with some uh, NATO SF. Yeah. They had obviously the nods and thermal capability, and we found one of them hiding in a toilet, and they just, they slap hacked him. Um, and then I was casually backed out about ten hours later. Just walked out, full weapon, full kit, good to go. Um, jumped in with Britmill and then they give me a lift to the aid station, American aid station. Wow. That's it in like sort of like, short terms, what happened? Wow. Um so did that sort of cement the idea that you were gonna leave CP work after having that engagement? Um no, I, I was fucking pissed, man. I was fucking pissed. I was like, my hands fucked. I really snapped, but that was this was my career. That's what I did. Yeah. It was only that it took it took two years to recover. Um, people go, oh, you just got shot in the hand, and it doesn't look that bad. And in the movies, people get shot in the hand, and they get shot, and mate, it fucks you up. And a seven six two short hits you, it messes you up. Hmm. Um, it totally destroyed the whole bone. Um, it destroyed the tendons. It damaged the tendons in the in the other in the other fingers. So for a, for two years, I could hardly move my hand at all. I took three three surgeries in total to to fix it, um, get remove tendons from one part of the hand and change it to other parts of the hand to take all the shrapnel out. I had loads of shrapnel issues as well, so fingers were like blown up, causing me immense pain. Um, they were like swelling up. We didn't know why, and it was the shrapnel was stick still in the hands. Wow. I had to go back in and get another operation to take like large chunks of metal out. Um, so yeah, it, it was just it was a ball mm -hmm. to sort of get that fixed. But I just remained positive. Um, I bought myself some uh, sim weapons. So like, you, I bought myself a Glock. Um, I bought myself a rifle just to sit in the house with, just like what you've got above you. Yeah. And I sat in the house and trained and trained and trained for two years just in my house, just. You know, going going from retention and drawing my weapon, and I couldn't hold the I couldn't hold the pistol grip. My hand was just like like that, and then so my support hand couldn't go over it. And I just used that grip, that pistol grip, to train on. And I did two years of physiotherapy trying to get that. And in the end, it, it even after the two years, it wasn't working properly. And the company offered me an out. He said, "Listen, we looked after you for two years." Are you going to come back or not? And I went, nah, that's me. I can't come back physically. I'm not safe to do so. Um, and so I left the company then. They, they looked after me for the two years, part of my insurance package. And then I left the company. And I was like, right, what am I going to do? Um, I'm not really safe enough for us to do it. But I kept on training. And I, I trained myself to now. My hand's strong as anything now. And I can, I can hold the weapons properly and ever. But they were a lifesaver for me. They were a lifesaver in, in the fact that it kept me sort of mind in the game. Yeah. And it kept me, it was me drive. I needed something. I could have easily just sat at home and did nothing for two years and just sat on my ass and drank beer all day. And I don't get me wrong, I did that as well. <laughs> but, and, and taking meds, I could have just sat there and took all the meds in the world to take the pain away and just, and that was it. And I could have easily have done that. But they gave me focus. So what you do and what you like, that was my focus, and it wasn't to play a game. It was for real for me. I was like, I keep training, I can go back to work. I've, um, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you there. I've spoken to a lot of vets who do do airsoft, who use you know uh, these sim weapons, and I think they use it for the mental injuries predominantly rather than the physical injuries. I know you were using them for your physical injuries, um, but I think perhaps there's also an element of helping with the mental uh, injuries that we. Get while we're serving, mate, and the men and the mental too. Um, so they diagnosed. I was sort of. I didn't. I didn't think it, I had anything wrong with me. And I, I still don't. Um, 
But well, the the centre we have what so you know in the military you have like a trim practitioner, tour risk management. Yeah. Um, and I was one of the trim guys in the in the in the within the company. Uh, why they asked me, I don't know, because I never believed in post traumatic stress disorder. I said it was a load of shit. I, I thought it was a, a crutch. I thought it was an excuse to not do your job. I really, that's how I thought. And uh, a teammate of mine was hit an ID and he, he was struggling a little bit. And I was like, stop being a fucking pussy. That was, that was, that's what I said to him. Stop being a fucking pussy, man. Get on with it. It is what it is. Let's fucking go. And then I'm sat at home and I was really angry. <laughs> really angry. And anger is one of them, is one of the key indicators and also regret. And I'd lived with the regret of not going in, in that in that incident in the in the cabal with the when my boss was killed. And yeah. I regretted it every day. Why am I going on my own? Why am I going on my own? I should have done I should have been the guy. I should have been the guy to go in. I'm a fucking dickhead. I waited too long. Look, I made a combat estimate myself and it was the right thing to do. I made the right decision, but I'm like, I should have went, I should have went, I should have went. And I live with that and I live with it daily. But those two things pinged up when I talked to the guy. He eventually spoke with a trim practitioner with me. And I, and I was like fucking pissed off. I'm like, mate, if I'd have had mods, we'd have been good to go. And we request all this kit. And we're sitting there and we, we drill these drills. And we do camp attack drills. We do do them every month. And we're like, we can't fight at night. This happens at night. We are fucked. And the door, and now we'll put a backup generator on and then you can fight in the light. Well, the backup generator was fucking didn't work. And we're like, we're fighting at night and we're like, we tell them we need, if we're, if we're a breach team, we need shields, like breach, breach shields. Yeah. Nothing. No fucking, not. And so I was pissed off with that, obviously. And a teammate getting killed as well and me being hit. I was like, I was more angry. And this guy's like, mate, you need to, we need to see some, you need to get some help. So they, I was like, no, nah, I'm fucking fine. And I felt fine. And there was nothing wrong with me, but I was angry and I was angry. Yeah. And, and I was still obviously stressed about that other incident. So they put me in touch with a, a professional clinic, clinician, psychologist, and I had to do that for a year. Um, but that using them and having that mentally in my head that I can, if I can train, if I can keep training physically, it'll keep me mind sharp as well. It'll keep me so that I won't lose my skill set. And I'm fucking in there on my own, man. I'm I'm in the house on my own. What else am I doing? My wife's at work. I spend hours just drilling, just drilling, trying to get my hand working, trying to get it working. So, yet it was a physical, to fix a physical, physical uh, deficiency, but it was also to keep me sharp, my brain working and go, no, you'll get back on the game, you'll get back in the teams, and that's what you'll do. Yeah. And so for them, it was a mental thing as well. Yeah. But in regards to like seeing people like sort of professionally, I didn't like it. It made me feel worse, if anything. Fucking hell. Yeah, it was te- it was terrible. I didn't like it at all. The guy was amazing. But I walked away physically, mentally fatigued every time I seen him. It it was it was emotional at times. You're like, for fuck's sake, I'm fine. You're making me bring up shit that I'm putting away. So, you know, all these little things, like me mates getting killed in Iraq, um, and two of them really good mates. I put all that away. Never you just Bang it away, bang it away. Um, then the stresses of working on your own, and, and he calls it redlining. You're redlining. You, you, you're threatening. You're always alert. So he'd ask about what I do on a daily basis, and and I remember my wife saying to me, "You're always looking out the window at people, looking at fucking women and stuff." I'm like, "I'm not. I'm just. I'm just. I'm security conscious everywhere I go, and I couldn't walk down the street without checking my six. Yeah, I'd go into a room, I'd go into a shop, I'd be checking, I'm analyzing people walking down the road, and and I'd do it in the car as I'm driving, I'd be doing what I'd be doing, and I couldn't turn it off. And he said, That's not healthy, <laughs> it's not healthy, mate. That's redlining that you're going to burn out. And after so much time, and he said, and adding to the fact that you've been hurt, that's the emotional state, and no one goes through that. If, you know, if you're getting it physically, but emotionally, you're going to feel that. And I was like, no, I'm fine. But I may be numbing that. I was taking lots of meds too, lots of pain medication. Yeah. So I may be numbing a lot of the emotions. Um, but for me, I did a year with this guy um, every couple of weeks for a year um, until he signed me off. But basically, I just found fucking fine. In the end, I was like, I'm all right. I'm going to leave me home. I'm good. And I just go back home and leave me home. <laughs> I didn't need it anymore. I just, I didn't want it in the first place. Um, but I know for other people, it serves its purpose and and it's it's a really good thing and people need to talk and you do talk. But sometimes that talk's horrible, man. 
Yeah. yeah. Fucking horrible. And I'd go and be drenched in sweat. And I go, where did that come from? Where the fuck's that just come from? And talk to my wife driving home. I go, I ain't coming fucking back here again. I feel fucking worse, love. And I'd, I'd speak to him and tell him, I go, I felt terrible for a week. He goes, it's good. That's good for you. Get it all out. Yeah. Oh, but I was, yeah, I was all right. So, a year of that. But as you say, using them was a, was a game changer for me. Um, yeah. And I know a lot of lads that you say, a lot of vets do it. Um, and it keeps them in it. I think it also keeps them in the mix because you don't want to let go. And that was the same for me. That's true. Yeah, it's the same for me. Yeah. Same for me too. Uh, I want to be conscious of not taking up so much of your time. Um, quickly moving on to your jiu-jitsu club that you've got running now and submission grappling. Uh, do you want to tell us a bit about that and where that came from? Yeah, so I've been training so before I left the mill. I started training MMA. I quickly um, it went on to like grappling, just grappling on its own. But wherever I was, I was training. I was deployed to Helmand as a contractor. I set up my own camps there for training. Um, same thing, I got to Kabul. I went over to the American base, started teaching over there. I just loved it. Got to Camp Angerman with just with the with the company guys set up a gym there downstairs in the bunker just teaching guys I love grappling so with that two years that I was off injured um, I was still training but just using one hand um, and then about two years ago now my coach moved abroad and me and my t- me and my teammate um, set up our own team and our own gym uh, it's called ASW Liverpool I teach Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, and we teach submission grappling. Picked up my black belt last year in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So we teach BJJ and we teach submission submission grappling Monday to Thursday, Saturday and Sunday. We have Friday no classes because nobody wants to train fucking Friday. Um, and then I've recently started. I started training uh, uh, sort of combatives. Yeah. Um, around 2003, when I was on that, when I was involved in that incident on my own in Kabul, I thought. I cannot. I knew of a guy called Rob Langdon. Um, he was an Australian who was in prison in Polisharki Prison uh, for killing a guy. He was on his own, self-defense, and he killed a, killed a guy, and he got nine years in jail for that. Wow. And I thought, I don't want to be that guy. Now, when you're in 16-man teams, it's okay, isn't it? Because you're supported by your team. You're going to extract. You know, you're untouchable. And then on my own, I'm like, shit, what do I do? Well, I can't bang a guy out if he gets in my face. <laughs> So I need to adapt my grappling skills. Um, but then I went there, I'm wearing body armor. I've got pistols on. Someone wants to grab the pistol. So I sort of I, I, I adopted a different mindset to an aspect of what I did in, for close combat. Um, so I've recently started. I just run my first two-day seminar. That was really successful on that. Military, police, and actually some nurses. The nurse, the male, who wow. needs to protect himself when he's on the wards. Um, so I've just that's my first two courses, my first two day courses on that. I'm running a one day course coming up soon, just on some private training. So I've got my own facility, teach grappling, sport grappling, sport jiu jitsu, and now I've got the hostile sort of close combat stuff starting to come up as well. Fantastic! I'll uh, drop a link in the description for anyone. Yeah, that'd be amazing. Yeah, yeah brilliant. All right. Um, last two questions is. Was there anything that you took into combat that was significant value to you? Something like a good look talisman? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I'm not religious. I'm not religious by a long shot. Um, I have no. I was brought brought up Roman Catholic, but I quickly got out of that. My poor little nan, you know, rest her soul. She was a and she was a every church every, every Sunday church. She was a full believer, and she took all of us as grandkids to church with her. And then, as we got a bit older, we sort of flew the coop. And then the next youngest grandkid got brought on. Uh, we only went for the sweets because she was great. She'd take us for sweets uh, straight after, take us to shop, got us a load of sweets. But she's like, she gave me a rosary bead. So I thought, out of respect, I'll carry them. And then to counter that, though, I had a skull and crossbones, death head, uh, sweatband, black and white. I carried that on my wrist, and then on the other side, I had me sort of rosary beads just, just in case the big man is up there. Uh, they were my talismans then, and I had them on both tours and wore them on both tours. I've got a few pictures of uh, on my Instagram, and you can see the rosary beads that I wore on, uh, on both tours there on my rig, just wrapped up around a bit of mouth. And then I've got the wristband, skull and crossbones, death head. Yeah, so I had a bit of both. Protect me, but I'm ready to save a bit of death out. 
Brent. Um, that's what I had. I've still got him in a bag somewhere in the shed. Uh, and my final question is, would you do it all over again? Yeah. Fuck yeah. Do everything again. I do everything. I'd never stop. I'd um, I'd make every decision. Do what I had to do. Maybe change a few things, of course. Um, I'd have still the moments I got hit that night. I got hit. I'd still do the same thing. I'd still lead that guy. I'd still lead them to that team at night in the dark and go looking for those fucking dudes. Um, that's your job, innit? You protect your teammates, protect yourselves, stay alive, you know. And in the process, take some bad dudes off the planet. Oh yeah, without a doubt. Brilliant. Well, it's been an absolute honour and privilege hearing some of your stories. And thank you so much for your valuable time. It's been an absolute well, mate, thank honor. you for inviting me on, mate. It's a, it was an honour for me and a privilege to share. Um, I'm always amazed at someone to listen. I don't know why you want to listen to me. I've not done nothing special. I've never, I never claimed to do anything special. Some dudes out there who are real gangsters who've done some real gangster shit. I haven't. I've just been lucky or unlucky enough to have a few unique situations being involved in them, but nothing to write home about. Um, nothing special by a long shot, mate. So, but so I appreciate you asking me. I really do. No, it's an absolute honour. Thank you very much indeed. And I thank you so much, brother. All right, you take care. Have a, have a good week. You too. Thank you very much. Take care, man. We'll <laughs>